Welcome to the Physique Development Muscle Series. In this special series, we're breaking down the science and art of training each muscle group. Each episode is dedicated to a specific muscle, providing you with expert insight into its function, dispelling common training misconceptions, and highlighting our go-to exercises that deliver results. We'll also share key execution cues to help you perfect your technique and maximize your gains. Get ready to elevate your training game and achieve your fitness goals like never before. Let's dive into chest. Before we get into the interview, welcome Bryce Calvin to the studio. After completing his Bachelor of Science degree from the Ohio State University, he also went on to complete his CSCS and dove right into helping as many people as he could through his company, Progressive Performance. What started as an in-person venture has rapidly transitioned and expanded into a community of hundreds of clients spread all over the globe and led by a diversified team of educated and experienced coaches. Bryce also co-hosts the Progressive Performance podcast podcast with Chris Beal. With unique experience helping both men and women grow this next muscle group, we thought he was the best person to talk about chest today. Bryce, it is great to have you on. It's good to be on. on. <laughs> <laughs> A long time coming uh, to have you on, and I'm excited to chat about chest, chest training for everybody. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk some chest. So, I mean, we'll get off, we'll get started on a a great question, and that is going to be, what is your top three chest movements? Oh, uh, boy. All right. So um, I'm going to try and do this without caveating every single thing. I'm going to do my absolute best here. So I'll say a weighted dip. And I'm also just speaking personally. Right. A good machine press. A good one. That's the, the context. Um, and then... Maybe like a an incline Smith machine press. Okay. Yeah. Do you have, or or a deficit push up? Oh, a def. I, I see you post very frequently about yes. these deficit push ups. Big fan of push ups in general, and I think that maybe I'm the oddity here. <laughs> yeah. So walk me through the the three. So with the dips, what's the the reason for those being a fave? Uh, I'm a big fan of anything that allows my scaps to move freely, mm -hmm. scaps and shoulders, especially whenever it comes to pec training. Um, and then also any thought, anything, anytime I can get a really deep stretch okay. through my pecs, I have just personally always found that dips are a really, really great movement for me. I'll say that they're probably not the best movement for every single person. Um, but I handle them and tolerate them extremely well. I get a lot of like really good biofeedback every time I do heavy dips. I've always been able to get really strong on them. Um, and yeah, yeah, it just, it, it's always been a solid movement for me. Uh, and then machine press, I feel like that's a relatively, what's the, what's the favorite brand? Do you have one that comes to mind? Um, let me think. I, I feel like I've used really good Nautilus machines okay. in the past, like Nautilus, Nautilus chess presses. Um, but to be honest, again, it's like anything that allows me to go through like a really controlled stretch mm -hmm. and doesn't destroy my elbows, wrists probably going to be okay with um and then smith machine yeah relative relatively simple there anything that i can like go heavy on overload take it through a full range of motion be pretty stable throughout the entire movement and then also like i don't know the deficit push-up do you want me to go into a little bit more <laughs> detail <laughs> you, there you can but i, ha I have some follow-ups to, yeah, to things before so for the the smith machine do you have a preference of it being a vertical bar path or slanted i, I will always prefer vertical yeah. just in general for like the the broad utility of it but if i am doing strictly presses i kind of like the backward angle okay to be honest because i have a natural backwards arc to all my presses anyway so i feel that whenever it comes to like a, a smith machine press having that backwards arc it feels more natural but broadly i'm just gonna say vertical because okay. that eliminates a lot of the the other issues that tend to come up with Smith, Smith machine stuff. I can agree with that. So for the the dips, I feel like one of the th common things that I get that's a, uh, I don't know, I don't know necessarily a negative, but something people experience is that they have pain through their neck or discomfort through yeah. their neck or soreness. How do you how do you combat that for clients? If they come to you saying like I'm getting pain in my neck, what are some of the cues that you go through with them? specifically with dips? Yeah, with dips. 
Yeah. So uh, I think the, f- the first thing is just making sure that everybody starts with like an assisted dip before they go into a body weight dip and then a weighted dip. Um, because if you can't get the movement pattern down, you probably shouldn't be doing it unassisted where your body's just swinging through space. Cause that just like a pull up that creates a lot of potential problems whenever you don't have that stability. But to be honest, I do like a machine assisted dip as well. Like even for myself or even for really strong people, it does provide that nice path to keep everything flowing smoothly. And you can really focus on exactly what you're doing. You can feel what your shoulder blades are doing, what your shoulders are doing, where your elbows are. And it takes a lot of the the extraneous movement out of it. But if you start moving into like just body weight, weighted dips, um, I think people understanding what is going on with their shoulders and shoulder blades is just a universal skill, probably not dip specific. That's just something that most people need to learn anyway. But once people have a little bit more proprioception that they can take their mind's eye and put it like into their scaps and figure out what the fuck's going on there, that tends to fix a lot of problems in general, not even just neck neck pain from dips, you know? Right. I would say, I mean, understanding that improves their chest training, their back training. I mean, a lot yeah, of things, yeah. a lot of things. Um, so walk me through the the beauty of the pushups. What's the, <laughs> what's the love for the pushups? Um, I mean, you're someone who's been training for a really long time. Yeah. Uh, after a while, you just start getting really beat up. Everything hurts. And if it doesn't hurt, it will probably hurt tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> it's just like a, a free for all. So you yeah. never know like when that next issue is going to pop up. So the movements that you can find that allow your body to kind of slot into whatever its natural patterns are, even if they are compensation patterns, I found that they tend to feel better and they tend to like work better over the long term. And I mean, everyone should be able to do push-ups comfortably, but I like, again, being able to move my shoulder blades freely, not being super bound up in any full retraction, full protraction, any depression, any weird angling going on there. I like that. Um, I also like the ability if I'm using like a push-up handle to modify how much pronation or neutral grip I have in my wrists. And there's just a lot more comfort there, getting a full range of motion, getting a deep stretch through the pecs. Again, you can really feel where your shoulder blades are. You can think about like retracting and squeezing your mid back. I mean, it's, it, it provides a lot of tactile feedback that I don't think comes with a dumbbell press, a bench press, a machine press, or a lot of other typical like pec related movements. You know, it's just, it's also, I feel like kind of a lost art. Most people just don't think of a push up as being sufficient enough once you're sufficiently advanced and strong. But even whenever I was my strongest, my biggest, I could still do, you know, a very deliberate, intentional set of 20 push ups and be fucked mm-hmm. the next day. Yeah. It was just, is it all depends on how you do it. For sure. Yeah. So <clears throat> with push ups, how do you progress it in a, a program? How do you overload that movement specifically? Yeah. So uh, I am a huge fan, just in general, of, of tempo manipulations. Like okay. I, I really like tempo manipulations for something like a push up. Um, but obviously, you can do deficit, which is another big thing I I love. If you're someone who has your hands on the floor and that's about all you can do, if you just increase that range of motion, elevate each hand, that tends to be a progression in and of itself. Elevating your feet again with that deficit, it's just more of that mechanical um, disadvantage that you're you're applying there rather than it being specifically load related. So I do like those things, Um, but I also truly don't think, like once you're sufficient and proficient on a pushup, if you're strong, you're not going to progressively overload the push up in a traditional sense. Like it's it's a supplemental movement, but I think that there's a lot that you can get out of it too. Like for me, one thing that I always have found a lot of use out of for push ups specifically is adding them into any kind of superset. Like okay. if if I were to be doing like a, a cable fly, cable fly, push up. Like that fucks my pecs up probably more than anything else I could ever think of. And it's just so simple. It's it's so simple, but just combining movements that feel pretty good for me, that train the pecs in a slightly different way, it, that's really all that I've ever needed. And it's like, I don't really think in those terms about having to like progress those. I have in the past really gotten lost in the sauce and like progressive overload and feeling like I need to progress every single thing. But to be honest, it's like you can think in terms of just progressing what you're feeling in the moment. Like, does this feel better this week than it did last? Do I feel like I'm getting a bigger pump, more blood flow 
than I did last week. Um, even things like shorter rest periods. Like if you if you want to do push ups, you can do like rest pauses, marathon sets. Have you ever done myo reps? For push-ups, I, well, no, I don't know for push-ups specifically. I'm Brutal. sure it's terrible. It fucking sucks. It fucking <laughs> sucks. Yeah, but it's like once you get really good at certain movements, you can just figure out ways of making them suck more. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's a skill. Yeah, it's a skill. <laughs> it yeah. is. Uh, you you talked about supersets, and and one thing that I know you and I can nerd out on for hours is uh, speaking to all the different ways we can approach different types of, of rep ranges or specialty type sets. So how do you implement things like supersets or cluster sets or things of that nature within your, your chest training, whether it be for yourself or for clients? Um, so I'll, yeah, I'll caveat that with everything related to intensity techniques, there has to be an underlying proficiency, right? Uh, I think so many people just get again, lost in the sauce of intensity techniques because they're fun and they're, they add a lot of that like novelty to training. Whereas typical training is meant to just be boring. Like if you're not advanced, your training should be super fucking boring. And even if you are, it should be 90% boring. Right. Right. Um, cause it's just a lot about doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, and just becoming slightly better at it every week. But once you do get to a point where you become sufficiently advanced, that you need things like intensity techniques. I found that it's it's good for people who are really strong, strong enough to where like if they do more volume, it will be negatively impactful, but they need more stimulus to continue to advance, right? But I feel like that's the threshold where most people need to like start looking at intensity techniques. It, it, they're like, if I add another set here, or add any more volume, I'm going to start really pushing my recovery capacity. So like, how do I get intensity to off offload offset that, that volume? And I, that's where I found intensity techniques to be the most effective, especially things like cluster sets, rest, pause, anything that can take a finite amount of volume and condense it while really skyrocketing the intensity within that. I love that. I think that's a good way of putting it. There's a, a strength and a advancement threshold that someone has to yeah. get to for it to be useful. Do you have a, a favorite intensifier? Cluster sets. Clusters. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, I'm like, like I'm a very, very quantitative person. Like I think in terms of numbers a lot, mm -hmm. which is kind of where it's been always challenging for me to remember that there's like a qualitative aspect to training too, where like now I've had to really shift my brain to be like, oh yeah, there are times where it just, it just needs to feel good. You know, like if it feels like shit, that's probably some <laughs> indication, right? Like don't yeah. push through that. Um, but with cluster sets, they're so definable. Like there's, there's a metric, there's a number associated with each variable that I've always been attracted to that because it, you can see the progress and it's so easy to make progress on some variable, right? So it's like, if you have a five by five, five by five cluster set with a hundred pounds. Um, you either get all 25 reps with a hundred pounds and let's say like, you know, 20 seconds rest between those clusters or you don't, mm -hmm. if you do, then you can add five pounds the next week and do the same thing. Or you can add, you know, an extra rep to each cluster, or you can reduce the rest period, whatever you want to do. But if you don't get it, then you just continue doing it until you get to those 25 reps in those parameters. It's just so easy. Like it's so simple. Um, and I feel like the simpler things are, the less opportunity that people have to fuck them up. And with what we do, like like we just are scarred mm -hmm. by people fucking up simple stuff. So like, I feel like I just gravitate towards the simple shit now. Yeah, well, I, I think that that's one thing as you coach for longer, you just get more and more simple as yes. it goes. Yeah. Because you just realize that as you want to use these fancy and fun different techniques, it's it can be hard to convey online. Yes. Yeah. And it, once you find a way to convey it properly online, then you can certainly use it. But until that time, you're just beating your head against a wall. And, and you kind of find a place where you're making assumptions for that person to understand. And you're like, oh, I got to pull back a little bit and be able to like really start at square one and get all the way to the point that I'm trying to get across. Which is difficult. Very difficult. It's, yeah. It's always been something that I've struggled with is reminding myself that my clients aren't me. Mm -hmm. and my clients don't have the same level of understanding or intuitive understanding with training that I do right. because it's just always made sense to me. Like whenever I look at a training program, I can be like, oh yeah, this exercise very easily subs for this exercise. Right. Or, you know, if I 
fail on this exercise, I probably shouldn't try and add load to the next week, right? Like just intuitive shit. For most people, that's simple. It makes sense. But for a lot of people, it's just impossibly difficult to grab, grasp for whatever reason. Um, but I, I do often try to remind myself that like what seems really simple for me is probably not that simple for a lot of people or they're just really overthinking it mm -hmm. and they're making it more difficult than it needs to be, which is another common issue that like, especially with competitors, I'm sure that you've dealt with quite a bit too. Sure. So um, yeah, just whenever you're in the online space, whenever you only work remote, whenever you're trying to do everything through email or through you know, YouTube videos or through Loom check-ins, and that's really the only communication that you have with your clients or with your audience, just trying to remind yourself all the time that like the simpler, the better is going to be a better strategy, like 99 out of a hundred times. Yeah. S Sue and I often say that if we had unlimited funds, we would fly out to each client when they start and then work with them for like two or three days, yeah. go through every possible exercise that we would need and then fly home. And yeah. then that would be the, that would be the, the best possible process. I can't imagine what the fee would be if we were to be like, we're going to do this now. Yeah. And it would be absolutely insane and terrible use of our time. <laughs> for sure. Um, I mean, off topic, but I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that that's what, uh, poor Mosey used oh, really? to do. Yeah. I, I think he, so he would go, he'd fly in to do like the ads. He would yeah. go into the gym and like get everything set up for them to get customers into the gym. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it, I but mean, they would do like a, like a 48 hour sprint or something like that to just yeah. like fill this gym, but they would fly out and do it like crazy. I'm not losing my mind. Am I? No, no, no. Yeah, You're yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. They would fly out and do it in person. And then they finally figured out how to create the model and then sell the, yeah. the model yeah, yeah. itself. Um, very interesting. So I don't have the energy. <laughs> no. No. Um, back on the, the topic of, of chest. Uh, length and partials are the yeah. craze yeah. for um, everyone training right now. It is the key to hypertrophy by many, <laughs> by many individuals. Do you use length and partials within your chest training? Do you have any thoughts? We can go into just the nuts and bolts yeah. of length and partials, but do you use it within your chest training? Um, so I think that it's a bad risk re reward trade-off for Pec specifically. Okay. Um, because I think that the way that the pecs cross the the shoulder joint, the way that the scaps move, there's too much freedom of movement through those joints, and there's a lot going on there. And because it doesn't have a, a definable end range, the more that you go into that lengthened stretch, the more risk you're putting yourself at, or more risk that you're you're introducing for something like a strain or tear mm -hmm. and because there's also multiple joints involved and there's again a lot of freedom of motion at the shoulder it's not just shoulder abduction adduction you're also getting pretty much every fucking degree of motion so because of that i, ju I just think that there's a lot of energy loss mm -hmm. or energy leak that happens with length and partials for the pecs even if you're thinking about something that is relatively controllable and stable, like a deficit pushup, right? Even with that, I would consider that to be like closer to an ideal movement to, to perform this specific technique on pecs. But even like, I, I just don't think that it is specific enough for the effect to work as well as it should for, for another muscle, for example, right? Like if we're, if we're talking about the hamstrings, right? If we're talking about talking about the hamstrings, that might be a better use of your time if you're doing like a seated hamstring curl, mm -hmm. because you can pre stretch it, you can hinge forward. And you it's an isolation movement, like you're not getting any other joints involved in that. And you can really, really, really push safely with that. Just with the pecs, it, do, it doesn't feel intuitively, like you'd be able to get more out of a length and partial for off the top of my head, really any movement. Mm -hmm. It, it, it doesn't seem like you'd be able to get more out of that than if you were to just perform a full range of motion or even like a loaded stretch. Like, I, I don't see the point of trying to go in that in-between area. I don't know what you think yeah. though. So for, for chest, I don't, 
there's not a whole lot of exercises that I'm like, these length and partials yeah, yeah. are better for them to do rather than just regular sets, especially yeah. we go back to the topic of teaching online yeah. and it being something where I feel when I've tried them with clients, when they go, they finish the, the end range of the first rep and they start to go for the one fourth portion, the acceleration that they have to get back to that bottom. Once they get to the one fourth, I feel like the trade off in that speed of just trying to build as much momentum to get back out of the hole yeah. is not actually improving the muscular tension yeah. as much as the passive tension that's just being displaced onto the joints or whatever the case may be. And so that's why I don't use it. And especially in a, a chest press, for example, I find that if they're when if they're doing a flat press, the likelihood that they're getting like this elevation and kind of pull back to the shoulder because they're trying to get a little bit extra range of motion is for the cost to reward is certainly not because I find from an inj injury perspective, probably going to be a higher risk of having that kind of weird angle to their shoulder. Yeah. Um, and then kind of like double emphasizing the speed and those different factors. So yeah, my, my question there too would be, what would, what would the benefit be to doing a length and partial versus just doing a movement and then going into a, a loaded stretch with like, like a flat dumbbell press. Right. And just taking the dumbbells fully into the stretch, pat, well, I guess passive stretch, but like mostly passive stretch, and just hanging out there for like sixty seconds because it's gonna fuck you up, like in the worst way possible. Have you ever done that before? I don't think I have. So I was gonna actually pick your brain a little bit on the the loaded stretches and how you use them in programming. Yeah. So um, so if you've never done it, do it. Okay. But like, be super careful. Um, but I I think that that's a really good just practical exercise for most people to do because a it's horrible it's like the worst pain you've ever experienced in your life all local in the packs it's brutal but there's this feeling of vulnerability that you have in that position as well so i'm like i wouldn't want to try and press out of this right you know like if i'm getting as deep into this range of motion as as i am in that position i wouldn't want to try and con like actually contract my my pecs and like do anything productive there other than just being passive and like just savoring how bad it sucks, you know? But what I've always done, if I'm doing something like that, is I'll do an isolation movement, whatever, like something yeah. to get a lot of blood into the pecs, mm -hmm. whether that's a fly movement, whether that's a, a machine press or a dumbbell press or a push up, whatever. Um, and then I'll just go into that flat dumbbell press hold. Okay. Um, so using like 50s and literally just hang out there for as long as I can take it. Usually it's 60 seconds but sometimes it's less but as soon as you stand up it's like your pecs have never been bigger oh wow ever okay. like it is the most ridiculous feeling you've ever experienced but everything just opens up so like for a lot of people that just have that massive internal rotation like sit at your computer look all day um i found that it's super helpful just for being able to open everything up there and kind of pull their chests apart pull their anterior delts back, allow them to feel what like scapular traction is supposed yeah. to, to feel like too, because ideally if you're in that position, you're gonna be fully retracted, like right. as, at least as fully as you can be. Um, but it just doesn't introduce as much risk because you can you can control those variables a lot more, right? You can say, hey, you're gonna do this with like 30% of your one rep max, don't do anything stupid, hold for 60 seconds, let it suck, right? But it gives you a lot more of an opportunity to be like, all right, this feels a little bit weird today, I'm just not gonna do it, not gonna be stupid. Versus if you're doing, I don't know, like a, a machine press and you try and add length and partials after that, I'm like, it just, it just I don't feel that the the risk reward is yeah. is what it potentially could be or would be with other muscle groups. So with the the um, the what was it the link what, what would you call it the I don't know what did I call it <laughs> the, when you're, you're you're holding the weight loaded stretch, loaded loaded stretch. <laughs> <laughs> went brain dead there for a second so with the loaded stretch how many sets are you doing? like if you're introducing it to a client how many sets are you introducing with maybe one maybe one okay. yeah um because another thing and this is something that you would definitely know if you've done length and partials that they will fuck you up oh yeah they will create a lot of muscle damage mm -hmm. and um a loaded stretch even more so so okay. did you ever do like any kind of dog crap training back in the day? Gosh, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so loaded stretches were a big component of dog crap. Um, and I, I went through a cycle way back in the day, did a lot of that shit, was like really into like the super high intensity stuff for quite a long time. I was like, I loved it, which is interesting because like, I feel like I've kind of shifted away from that um, as I've 
gotten smarter and more practical. <laughs> um, but there was a huge component and they had very, very specific ways to do loaded stretches for pretty much every muscle group that you could imagine. Some of them I tried and I was like, this is not working the way that this is supposed to. Other ones I'm like, this is clearly going to get people hurt. But for the packs, I was like, that's interesting. Could work, yeah. Like, like this one does this. It works pretty well. Um, the quads. I don't know if have you ever done like Lotus. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Um. So, I I can't remember what the yoga pose is called, but like where you just like sit on your feet and like lean back mm -hmm. and like really like a reverse Nordic, basically. Essentially, yeah. It's yeah essentially, yeah. like a reverse Nordic hold where you just like extend your hips and lay back as far as you can. Yeah. Um. If you do something like a set of thirty leg extensions. And then and go, go into that. I bet that's horrible. It's, it's, oh the, worst thing, it's the worst thing you can ever imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. But your rec fam has to be destroyed. But that's that's the point, right? Yeah. Like that's the idea. Wow. But yeah. also too, like I found that loaded stretches are great for hypertrophy. They're they're awesome for mm -hmm. it. But mobility, like mobility, is probably the absolute biggest benefit that loaded stretches have. Um, and I think that that gets overlooked a lot. Yeah. Like a lot, a lot. Because if you're someone who has knee issues, hip issues, hip extension issues, and you just sit in that position while getting a lot of blood in your quads and your hip flexors, that will eventually, it's going to suck. It's going to suck, but it will eventually open everything up while you're also getting the muscle growth benefits that you're looking for too. So it's like two birds with one stone. Um, but the potential to abuse loaded yeah. stretches, I think is probably pretty big yeah. um, especially whenever some, something starts getting pretty hyped up like length and partials um it's just you have to be very very skeptical of anything that just feels like it's being touted like the the savior yeah for sure yeah it's it's, it's well i think that the industry itself is making the problem because for it's sure. like they're making content around it they're saying this is the holy grail it's getting views all that kind of thing so i i get that um attention all coaches are you struggling with client adherence retention and motivation and do your clients self-sabotage and lack the drive to succeed we have the perfect solution for you Starting August 8th, join Casey Joe and her expert team for The Coaching Code, a transformative and free three-part series designed to revolutionize your coaching approach and ensure lasting client results. Here's everything that you'll gain. In Training 1, it's all about the missing piece in nutrition and exercise certifications. You're going to discover the often overlooked elements that make coaching more effective and less frustrating. You're going to learn how to integrate these elements to streamline your coaching process. Going into training two is going to be all about communication strategies for behavior change. You will master the art of navigating challenging clients who frequently fall off the wagon. Equip yourself with specific actionable questions that boost client motivation and mindset. And rounding out at training three is the behavior change blueprint. You will uncover the four essential ingredients of effective coaching and ensure your clients stick to the plans and stop going ghosting you. This series is a game changer. It's three powerful trainings, absolutely free and designed to make you a better coach and your clients more successful. Don't miss out on this win, win, win opportunity. Secure your spot now and transform your coaching practice. Click the link in the show notes to register and let's elevate your coaching together. When we go into, let's say we have a client who comes to you, they're wanting to get a massive chest. We'll say, we'll say, male or female, but we'll, for this specifically, we'll say male and they're wanting to get a massive chest. Where do you start with them? How do you structure their, their push days, for example? Um, obviously everyone is so different. Everyone's so different. And it's, it's really going to depend also on what the, like, experience the rest, level and those different what things, the, the rest of the program too. Um, but I mean, just in general, I, I am a huge fan of a very bro standard progressive overload, like okay. huge fan of it. Um, I, I, don't think that that can be overlooked and i don't think that it should be overlooked um the benefit of just trying to become really really strong on every movement that should be everyone's goal to be honest um but once you get to that point you can start focusing on some other like less tangible goals i guess uh, but to be honest i would say like if you're someone who really really wants a big chest obviously move all of your chest volume to the beginning of that session like don't be doing a bunch of like arm work calf work ab work and then go into your pec stuff like be very fresh whenever you are doing it mentally and physically 
find a movement or a series of movements that works very well for you. If you're really strong, you probably don't need that many movements. You can probably disperse your volume throughout the week a little bit better. But I mean, like I'm very much someone who's like, all right, I can generate a lot of intensity mm -hmm. personally, and I don't need a ton of volume to create a, a pretty large stimulus. So if I do like a machine chest press, I can work up to like a rest pause set or a cluster set mm -hmm. on that. And then I can go to like a, an incline dumbbell press or a dip and get like, you know, three to four sets in there just to build some volume and round that out. And I'm pretty, personally, I'm pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I do know that there are other people who need slightly more, like to, like you might need a third exercise. But I, I think whenever people start filling out their, their, all right, if you have a pec day, that's probably also slightly problematic. Like I'm not a huge fan of hyper specificity in terms of like training splits, but I mean, I guess that's a, a separate topic. Um, I mean, we can, we can even dig into yeah. that a little bit. Cause I agree with you of the amount of exercises needed is important to kind of cross everything off the list, depending yeah. on what we're trying to accomplish. But also there's a point where we're just going to get into diminishing returns. The intensity threshold that we're able to get to at a point within the exercise selection, is just going to not be worth the squeeze. Um, would you, so you think three set, three exercises, it depends on what the exercises are, of yeah, course. For sure. for sure. Um, and you gave an example. I, I would, I would agree that it's generally going to be three solid movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like if, if you're doing, I'm trying to think if there would be a scenario where three wouldn't be enough and for chess specifically, yeah. if it's like a, if you do a fly, uh, I don't know. Now I'm thinking of it like, man, any three exercises you put together, it's probably enough. Yeah. Um, I will say this, it, it all depends on like the volume too. Like yeah. it depends on how you're distributing your volume. Um, it also depends on if you have, so if you have another session in the week, right? If you're doing a, a pec day, but you're not training your pecs the rest of the week, you might need a, a third exercise in that day because the like implicit understanding there is that you're fucking your pecs up on that single day because that's the only opportunity you have throughout the entire week yeah so you might need more right um or wait do you say a fourth three or four well i guess i mean now that i'm thinking about it three would be definitely my cap mm -hmm. two would probably especially so i prefer to split it into two days yeah for, i would oh, rather sure. have two yeah two push sessions that I would have per week. If someone's yep. goal was to grow their chest, yep. I would say two push sessions um, with a priority of like one movement on one day is a really big deal. And then one movement as the other day. And then we kind of have either another movement or two other movements that are being implemented on those particular days. I potentially, I, I tend to agree. I tend to yeah. agree. Um, how do you feel about like pre exhausting or activating. Mm. I know that that's like a weird word yeah. for a lot of people. Like they just have like emotions around it, but like, man, how do, how do you feel like, or how do you feel about using movements to pre-exhaust or get your, your chest pumped or primed or whatever other word you want to use for that before going into like an overloading pri primary movement? So I think for someone who is fairly strong, yeah. I think it's a useful tool. Yeah, I think that if someone is able to go through a, a cable fly of sorts or just get a lot of blood and tension to the chest and then go into their presses, I find for myself personally that I have better sessions when I do that. And the same thing goes for when I'm training lower body. I really like doing, if I'm squatting in a session, I really like doing like two or three hard sets of a lying hamstring curl and then going into my squat. I just feel like my squat pattern feels better. Um, so for chess, I like to do, you know, something similar, uh, especially in the setting where I'm sitting at a desk, like, I mean, 90% of my day. Yeah. And so I'm not getting a ton of overall movement and going straight into my first movement being my most important of the day seems like it's kind of a, it feels like I may be not getting the most out of it. Whereas if I do the, the pre-exhaust, for example, I feel like I get more out of my entire day as a whole. I would, I would agree. Okay. I would agree. Um, I, I do think that the stronger that you get, the less your focus needs to be on like traditional progressive overload mm -hmm. because you're already pretty fucking strong. Like at a certain point, you're just seeing diminishing returns with trying to add more and more load. And it's honestly going to start becoming negative pretty soon because you're just going to be beating your joints up faster than your muscles are actually going to be adapting. So in that scenario, I definitely think pre-exhausting or yeah. having some kind of like fly-based movement or isolation movement or lighter movement, whatever you feel really well. I think that's helpful in those instances. I think for a lot of people that are not strong enough yeah, and 
should really be focused on going into their primary movement with as much energy as possible. I, I see a lot of people, they get, they like put the cart before the horse whenever it comes to not just pecs, but like everything too. Like they're, they exhaust themselves doing activation shit. And by the time they get to their primary movement, they're, they're already, trashed. Yeah. They're already tired. Like, because they've done so much before that. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a big problem with like lower body, like glutes. It's a huge yeah. problem. But I think pecs as well, because pecs are not that big of a muscle. Like they're really not, yeah. but they're so important for a lot of people. And a lot of people treat them as if they're as big as the, the glutes or the quads. Um, so I, I do think that people can kind of fuck themselves a little bit if they do a lot of pre-exhausting or priming work and with the intensity sufficiently high. If they're trying to cross that boundary between like, okay, I'm doing this, like get my mind ready and I'm doing this as like an extended warm up, or if I'm doing this for like actual stimulus, that's where like, once you start crossing that threshold, then you're just fatiguing yourself before your primary movement and you're not able to overload as well as you might've been otherwise. Yeah. You know what I'm saying there? No, hundred yeah, yeah. percent. I think I, I, I'm with you on it. It's one of those things where it's so individually dependent sure. of where they're at within their training, where their strength is at and those different factors. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. Now, um, what was my next question? I had something and now as I talked, I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. My brain doesn't work very well most of the time. <laughs> Um, let me, I, I did have a question for you. Okay. Uh, let me think. Oh, oh, this is actually a good one. Um, how do you feel about women in pec training? This is a great one. Uh, I feel like it is such an underrated part of what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I find agreed. it to be something that many women want to just feel like they are carrying some tissue through their upper body. It's not like they're trying to be absolutely jacked, their traps, their delts, having this a bunch of pop, but they are wanting to have a little bit of muscle tissue through their upper chest, have nice tissue through their delts, and then a little bit through their back at bare minimum, right? And so <clears throat> having the pec training in place allows for that to be complete. Because I think that oftentimes when a, a female is not having like the full look through their upper body, it's often that they're lacking a lot of upper chest tissue. Yeah. And then their delts kind of just like are there or they're having a lot of dysfunction through their their training elsewhere as well. Yeah. It's like, well, my delt training doesn't feel all that great. My upper back training doesn't feel all that great. And then all of a sudden, once we start to incorporate a little bit more pec work and they're going through more of a complete range of motion, going through retraction, going through a little bit of protraction, it's finally like, oh, it's all clicking. It's like, well, your pecs are actually a contributing part to all this going on. Now. Yeah. So it's, it's a underutilized tool that many people, like many women, I believe are afraid of, or have been told like, you don't need to do this because you're not trying to get like double D titties with your pecs basically. So I, I actually wrote an article on this not that long ago because I, I had so many women coming to me. I think it was like such a very short time interval where I was like, all right, I'm fucking over this. Like, this is annoying me. Um, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think that, you know, if you're a woman you should in some way be training your pecs. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you need to be training them to grow muscle though. Like uh, a horizontal push is a primary movement pattern. You need to be doing that to make sure that your body is functioning the way that it needs to be functioning. Um, if you're doing tons of overhead pressing, but you're doing no horizontal pressing, your body's gonna become unbalanced. It's gonna start developing compensation patterns. That's not what you want. And women are compensation patterns to begin with. I mean, men are, but I've worked with so many competitors that are just walking injuries because of what they do and how they train. Mm -hmm. And also the, the, the rules of the division basically press them to be hyper-focused on very specific body parts, mm -hmm. glutes, delts, and shy away from others, quads, pecs, arms, and whenever you instill that into a lot of people, like it, it really becomes like a, a brain worm that they can't get out. And again, I'm sure that you've dealt with this a lot where it's like, you'll give people a, a squat pattern. They're like, I feel this in my quads, not my glutes. It's like, yeah, no shit. You're bending your knees. You're going to feel it in your fucking quads. Like, what do you want from this? Like, it's okay, bro. Calm down. Like if someone's doing uh, an incline press, like I feel my pecs working. Well, yes, like your pecs are a muscle. They are working. You know, it's okay. It's fine. That's how your body's supposed to work. Um, but people just try and fight their bodies. They, so often they try and fight it and they misinterpret 
like that that proprioceptive feedback that their body's giving them saying hey like i'm moving through this space and they interpret that as like a bad thing it's like no your body is supposed to be working like this like if your pecs were not working while you're doing a high incline press or in any kind of press you'd be fucked yeah. like that's not good right like you want these muscles to be working they're contributing so if they're contributing during an overhead press and you deem overhead press to be valuable you need to make sure that your pecs are strong enough to support that in whatever way that means right um but i'm really big on doing some kind of pressing right and that doesn't need to be like bench pressing and i think that that's where most people get so lost with they're like they assume pec training means bench pressing it's like no it's not what it means like you can train your pecs in a lot of different ways um, for a lot of different goals too it doesn't have to be like trying to max out on on bench press it can be like a low to high incline fly it can be uh, an incline barbell press or dumbbell press it can be a dip like there are a lot of different ways that you can incorporate pec training that have multiple goals and functions as well so it doesn't just have to be pecs it can also be delts it can also be shoulder mobility it can also be scapular mobility right like there's a lot of things that can ha happen there um so i i'm huge on women and, like i'm just big on forcing people to think outside of like what they've been told or what they've been like instilled to think and believe and i just think that that's like such a a dogmatic way of thinking that again it's like created brain worms and like you just have to root out the brain worms for a lot of people um but another one that i am thinking of right now because we're on this topic um breast dogs that's what literally i was gonna ask you yeah yeah <laughs> how uh, do you um how do you navigate past breast dogs because it is a it's an individually dependent conversation sure. uh, because yeah. some individuals really experience pain with training with their breast augmentation, whether it be a problem with how the augmentation went or because they've gone so long with the breast augmentation, they haven't had any training at this point. They're having such dysfunction that they're, they're having pain because there's such an imbalance. And so you've got to like get, you strip it all the way down to the nuts and bolts and like restart with them on some things. Um, so it, it's, it's a hurdle. I am a proponent of training chest with a bre breast augmentation. Um, it being something where I, I more so introduce it in a way that we're going to focus on upper chest first and foremost. That's going to be the focal yeah. point of like incline pressing. But I want to get to a place where we're able to do horizontal pressing without pain. Yeah. But that takes that takes a little bit of time. And also the client has to be comfortable with it and having that conversation. It's more of like a, a progression of getting more and more comfortable of like, okay, I'm like, these are not just going to pop in my chest as soon as I go into retraction. Yeah. And then now I'm able to get there. So what, what are your experiences or, or thoughts? Um, so I've, I've worked with so many women that have been in the middle of a recovery, or I've been able to coach them through a recovery from a breast dog, or they had gotten a previous breast dog and come to me afterwards. Dude, so many people, yeah. so many, like, you know, my clientele, so like so many, right. Um, so I've dealt with pretty much everything that you could ever imagine. Um, and I agree with you hundred percent that it is very individual. Sometimes the surgeon is horrible and they just create a ton of scar tissue and they fuck these girls up and they just have a lot of pain and discomfort and immobility mm -hmm. associated with pretty much everything having to do with their upper body forever after that, unless they have something corrective done, which sucks, which yeah. sucks. And in those cases, there's really not that much you can do for them if you're a remote coach. But I will say that 95% of the cases that I've dealt with, the issues have been overcomable. I don't think that's a word. Able to overcome. Yeah. Or they've been psychological. Okay. I think psychological issues are bigger, to be honest, mm -hmm. because they're told that they can't train their pecs. Like they're, the surgeons, the doctors literally tell them, like, you, you will not be able to train your chest after this. Right. So they just never try. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting that that is the, the framework that so many surgeons yeah. work from. It's yeah. just like, don't ever train this chest or train this, train this yeah. muscle group again. It's a liability issue. Yeah. Um, but you see this with pretty much every medical practice. It's like every recommendation, every bit of advice that they give is hyper conservative compared to like what normal practitioners in that field would, would do or recommend. Um, like you see it with nutrition you see it with just general training advice exercise in general like they just give the most benign yeah. <laughs> recommendations and advice that they can possibly give and then just like like coax back coax themselves back into the shadows and like yeah. I, I can't be held liable right um 
But I think with surgeons specifically, it's like they they say, hey, just don't do anything because then you can't fuck it up. Right. And but I can't be liable for anything. And issues. I can't be liable. Yeah, exactly. And like you're not going to say, oh, I went to Dr. So-and-so and look at what my ugly boobs look like now, <laughs> right? Like look how fucked they are. Um, and and also like there there are legitimate risks associated with like rushing oh, back sure. yeah. from a breast dog. I mean, it's it's – an invasive surgery and depending on how you get it done i mean that they, they might be cutting through muscle tissue um which yeah that takes quite a bit of time to recover from not even counting the inflammation the swelling all that it's it's not fun um but we're it, sitting here talking like we've been through it oh know? yeah so I, like <laughs> like I've, I've, i got them right now <laughs> I, I've, I've empathetically been through it so many times i've practically been through it same thing with pregnancies that's what i'm gonna like lean myself into but uh but no like I will say that I, I have a pretty good strategy for for how to do it now. Like typically, it's just you know four weeks. We don't do any upper body. Ease yourself back in. Or fuck, this maybe, is coming off the this is coming off the procedure. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, it no upper body for like the first four weeks. Potentially not even any training, just depending on like you know how that recovery is going. Obviously, ease back in lower body only. Be very care careful with anything that requires grip, like leg press. Probably shy yourself away from because you don't want to accidentally pull yourself down and, and rip something. And then as soon as you like start adding in upper body, it's obviously only very, very controlled movements. Start with back stuff, but even back, like you're not gonna be able to do vertical pulls because you can't put your arms above your head at first. So it's gonna be very restricted. But I would say as you're able to slowly pull that mobility back, which I'm very big on force recovery, as fast as you possibly can, force yourself into these positions because if you don't, then you're just gonna develop Scar, scar tissue around them, but also you're going to start developing compensations around those immobility issues. And the faster that you can get back to a full range of motion, the better your life is going to be. And that goes for any, any injury. Um, caveats apply to all of that. Like don't do anything stupid, right. but like, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable, if that's okay, as long as you're not creating additional issues, but going in, doing some, you know, horizontal rows, probably going to be okay. Um, Eventually, might be able to do overhead presses, could potentially be okay. Yeah. But for whatever reason, vertical pulls tend to be very difficult for a lot of women coming back from a breast dog. Hmm. Um, and that's usually one of the last things to come back. Sometimes that's even later than horizontal pressing. Hmm. I don't know if you've ever experienced do you have any, that. Any theories why? Um, I think it's just because that scapular elevation, the, the shoulder elevation in general, thought, yeah. it, it pulls the pecs and stretches them so much upwards. And also like the pec minor really gets lengthened through that. But I mean, just think about like, if you have your arms above your head, it yeah. really, really lengthens it. But if you're doing an overhead press, typically you have your scaps and shoulders depressed much more. You're not right. reaching yeah. through it. Whereas a vertical pull, it's literally, it's stretching yeah. everything upwards. So that's my theory. Um, and then obviously as you start to engage and, and bear down, if, if you ever watch like a really jacked person, really jacked guy doing a pull down, you can see how their upper pecs are contracting. Yeah. Like you, you see that happening in real time. And that's just because there's a lot of like stabilization going on through a vertical pull. Um, and a lot, not a lot of people think about that. No. Right. Um, but it's kind of the same what we were talking about if you're doing an overhead press like your, your pecs are engaging just to stabilize yeah. too like there's there are a lot of those components but um before i would ever have anyone do a loaded horizontal press coming back from a breast dog i'd make sure that they're able to just stabilize in a horizontal press like position so just get them in a push-up position and be like hey just hold this mm -hmm. how does this feel at the top you're saying yeah just okay. just in lockout how does this feel okay go through like scapular retraction and protraction mm -hmm. without pressing just move in this position yeah. and if you can't do that go from your knees and do it right um and then just very slowly maybe we'll just start with like rack push-ups right so just put a, a bar at waist height and just very very slowly go through that range of motion if you can there have also been times whenever it's been really slow getting back and I'll have people just do like push-up position holds on like a BOSU ball. Okay. Just because it it forces them to like dynamically contract against a lot of that instability. And just that does a lot to like loosen up the scar tissue in the shoulder and in the pecs. Okay. Um, and typically it'll feel a little bit weird, 
but it's not like one of those half Bosu balls. Yeah, yeah. So okay. whenever I, I say Bosu ball, I mean the half Bosu yeah. ball. Yeah, yeah. So I was clarifying for the listeners because I, yeah. I knew that's probably what you meant. But <laughs> yeah, don't, aren't they? Aren't the half ones specifically called Bosu? I don't know. I, I think the half are called Bosu. I think oh. that's a brand. And then the other ones are. Oh, I called the full. Full. What's the full one? Like the a, full, I, I call them Swiss balls. Swiss balls. Okay. Yeah. Or I know the, a lot of people call them yoga balls too. Who knows? I, I, I call them all Bosu balls. I don't know. I think it's just a half one, man. Oh, interesting. I'm yeah, getting educated. I, here. I think I'm I'm lear- I'm learning you. Yeah. Um, one of my theories for why the vertical pull is probably the most uncomfortable is that for that those lower pec fibers, it's the most stretch mm-hmm. that they've gotten yeah. for those particular fibers probably s- since far before their sur- before the surgery. Um, and then also it's kind of like pulling the the implant more towards the armpit, which is not where it wants to go. And so both of those things I would imagine are the culprits of the discomfort. Yeah. Um, and so if there was any scar tissue, that's when it's going to get pulled on, I would say. And that's the biggest complaint that you hear from women post breast aug is it feels like it's going to shoot into my armpit. Yeah. Which – I'm sure is like the absolute worst feeling in the world. I I can't can't even, I can't imagine how that feels, (laughs) but that's also like really scary. Like you don't want to push through a feeling like that because it feels wrong. Yeah. Um, so I totally get it at the same time though. Like I, again, I'm like a huge proponent of if you are capable of doing something safely, try and do it every once in a while. Cause if you don't, you're going to eventually not be able to do that safely. Like your body is just going to be like, fuck it. I don't need to do this anymore. So there's no point in me maintaining resources to be able to do it. I'm going to focus on the things that I'm continuously doing. Same thing with like, have you, uh, do you ever do like lateral lunges or caustic squats? Rarely. I would say lateral yeah. lunges, uh, depending on the the individual. I, I find that with lateral lunges being so adductors, I have the women who come to me, adductors are not the thing that we're yeah, struggling yeah. with. Yeah. So I feel like it's one of those things that I'm not doing a lot of direct work for, if we even want to call it that. Yeah. yeah. No, um, the reason I even bring that up, and I know that we're talking about pecs, but I think that anything that is is a good example of a movement pattern that people we we typically don't use whenever it comes to like traditional gym exercises hypertrophy exercises um any anytime you can think of an example of something that is kind of outside of that realm of of normal and relate that back to any other muscle group i think it's a good idea to do because then it just kind of it gives you an image as like hey if i don't use this what will happen and lateral lunges caustic squats are a great example of that in my opinion because if you don't ever do them you literally cannot do them comfortably. Like your body shuts down that movement pattern. It's the frontal plane, right? I was trying to think in my mind while I was talking. I, I don't speak in that jargon oh, a lot. God damn it. All right, I, yeah. I've tried to avoid speaking in that jargon because it's like only so, less than a percent of, of the people listening are gonna under like know what I'm talking about. And then it's just like- You know what? It's, it's fucked up because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've struggled with sagittal and frontal plane since I think college. While I was in school, yeah. And I've looked at the same thing like hundreds of times and I always confuse myself with yeah. front. It's the, like the one thing I always get really confused with. But anyway, I'm pretty Sorry, sure it can be any help because we pretty sure it's frontal, pe- frontal <laughs> plane. Um, but yeah, like if you're never doing a, a lunge based movement in yeah. the frontal plane or side to side, whatever the fuck, um, then your body will just shut. De- it'll shut it down. Yeah. You'll forget how to do it. Your hips will start to lock up. You won't have that that external rotation anymore you won't have that dorsiflexion ability anymore you won't be able to do it unless you're like a very hyper mobile woman but typically they're doing activities that are allowing them to go into those positions every once in a while bigger guys aren't yeah like most big guys that are are bodybuilders or strength athletes especially if they're a power lifter and they're very focused on like three movements they're not doing shit like that maybe if they're like doing sumo as a deadlift but anyway um that that is a, a great example of like an exercise that like if you have not done that in a while and you never do it the first time you try and incorporate that back you're like holy shit like this just feels horrible but the more you do it you regain it really quickly it just feels like you're going to get injured yeah every single time and it feels so bound up so stiff and and again i think i think that if you're relating that back to like pec training um if you're a woman who's just never doing any horizontal pressing your body is going to lock that down Mm -hmm. because it's going to say i don't need to do this anymore what's the point of of me maintaining the ability so anyway yeah are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing 
turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Um, so when it, let's get back to some, some program design for, for chest. Now, one thing that you and I, um, definitely align on is, is failure training, how we approach failure within training, utilizing RP, utilizing RIR. Um, when it comes to training to failure with chest training, how do you approach that? How do you use it within client programming? Um, it depends on the exercise block, man. I, <laughs> I, I hate having to say this, but like I, I do think it's really important though, right? Because yeah. it's, it's obviously not what people want to hear because anytime you tell people that they have to think about stuff before they do it, it's going to be obviously more challenging. Um, but I mean, I'm not going to tell people that they need to go to failure on a barbell bench press, but also say that they should never go to failure on a pec deck. Right. Like there are inherent safeties two different exercises. And I think that that's very important to qualify whenever you're talking about failure. Um, beyond that, I, I do think that if you're failing on a pec based movement, it's not going to be as damaging as if you're failing on a quad based movement or hamstring based movement, like a, a deadlift variation, right? You're probably going to be relatively okay. You're, you're going to be good, especially if you're doing a lot of like machine presses or even dumbbell presses where like the, the mode of failure is not catastrophic. Mm-hmm. If you're doing a barbell squat, Really, there are only a few ways to fail, and none of them are very pretty. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I I think that failure with pecs is okay. It's it's okay. But in general, I think that understanding how close you are to failure and being able to work around that and navigate failure as a landmark is what everyone should be aiming to do. And that's always my thing, right? Like whether you train to failure or you don't train to failure, or if you train beyond failure, I don't think any of that fucking matters. And I think that that argument is mostly pointless. Mm. And I think that the people that are arguing for that continuously are missing the point. I think the point is you should understand what failure feels like, and you should be able to navigate around that depending on your, your context or your client's context. Yes, not everyone needs to train to failure to make progress. I think that that's a very important point to make. Certain people do, or it's just easier for them to make progress like that, or they are not smart enough to work with RIR. It's close enough, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I hate to say it like that, but dude, like, there are some, certain people, if you put RIR next to something, like, their brains are going to shut down, or RPE, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, and that's fine, right? But you also probably should not put five sets in front of whatever that that is, because then they're going to assume they have to train to failure for five sets, and that's fucking stupid. We know that's stupid. Um but again, I think it's just a trade-off. It's a trade-off. Failure is like the ultimate trade-off in training. And if you're doing every set to failure, you probably shouldn't do that many sets. And you should probably be choosing exercises where the mode of failure is easy, safe, not going to you know put you at any additional risk of straining your pecs. Um, also, something where you can't cheat, right? Because I think that's also important if you're just going to be logging and tracking and progressing over time. Um, but outside of that, man, like I, I, I hate to say it because I, I feel like I've really gotten caught in the weeds of this argument for a long time, but I think people just, they're arguing to hear themselves argue. And I don't think that they're approaching the question from the right perspective anymore. And I, I think that there's just a divide and that divide just continues to scream louder than the other side. And there's like not anyone willing to just step into the middle and be like, Hey guys, like shut the fuck up. You're all doing it wrong. Can we just agree to disagree and take some 
from one side, some from the other side and just like roll with that, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, do you think there's a, a better question? Do you know what the better question would be? Yeah. How to use failure in your training. Okay. Yeah. Like, um, and, and I do think that certain people ask that, right? Like, how do you use failure in your training? But then that automatically spills into, well, do we even need to use failure? But I think that failure is fine. Like it's fun. It's easy. It's actually easy. So it's, like it's easier. Of yes. the two. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that's where, that's where I, I think that people argue past each other too. Right. We're like the RIR side is like, oh, well, you know, failure is so fucking easy to do. So that's why people continue to do it. And then from the other side, it's like, oh no, failure is so hard. That's why we need to continue to push people to that so that they understand what, what failure even feels like and what it means. But I think that both, it, both are true, right? Like you obviously need to understand what failure feels like to be able to use it as a landmark or a guide. So if you always train to RIR and you've never have experienced failure, how do you know what RIR you're training to? So then do you have a favorite movement that you teach failure in? Um, I'm dude, just a fucking machine press, man. Yeah. Like a machine press. That's it's so easy. Um, because it's standardized, it's controlled, it's stable. And if you fail, nothing bad happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that that's good at the same time though. Like I do think that I hate to say it like this, but there is a certain aspect of failure where I think that fear should be good because you need to understand like what a very, very hard, heavy set should feel like psychologically so that you don't always go there. Um, but just in general to teach people what failure feels like, I always prefer leg press just, okay. just, just as, as, as a very broad example. Um, because I, I think that nothing really, nothing else really instills fear like failure on a leg press does. Okay. And then that really like opens your eyes as to like what, what this means as a concept. And that's the most important part for me is like people understanding what failure as a concept is supposed to mean. And also understanding like, okay, with upper body, I can probably get away with training closer to failure because it's not as disastrous to my nervous system for lower body maybe I shouldn't take five sets to one RIR on a leg press and, you know, 10 to 15 rep range, like those types of things. It's just understanding what certain shit should feel like. And then the impact of failure on training too. Right. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I feel like this whole episode, we're like, we agree. I know we that's agree. how our conversations <laughs> always go though. Like I, we, we need to in, inject some kind of like controversy to get us like riled up at each other. Do you have any, any, uh, chess training topics that you feel like would be, uh, inflam not, I don't know if inflammatory, but something that would be, maybe you feel differently about. Um, I do feel like focusing on the divisions of the pec is mostly yeah um, I, I i literally wanted to ask you this earlier so i'm so glad to bring it back up uh but it's, i feel the same way about a lot of things like like this right um for the most part i feel the same way about training delts like this mm -hmm. because there are very few lateral raise variations that don't also incorporate your anterior and re rear delts right like and granted i get i get that there are disparities there but um i think that trying to view the the pecs specifically as like two almost independent muscle groups mm -hmm. i get it from like a a physics and like angles and torque perspective and i think that that's okay to understand understand like hey there are certain angles that i should probably be using and incorporating into my pec training mm -hmm. and certain ways of doing it but i think if you're i think teaching it that way might be slightly problematic because it then introduces another thing that people have to think about and i, I view lat training like this too like okay. I, I think that lat training is good to think of as just lats rather than three divisions of the lats right. and I, again it goes back to the, com the wow i can't talk the complexity right. aspect um like even for myself i like i struggle to be like okay shit like what division of my lats is this yeah. hitting right now you know whereas i'm like Bro, it's just just fucking train. And and I hate to simplify things that much. Yeah. But I do think that we often need to be reminded. It's like, bro, just slow down. It's mm -hmm. okay. Just remember to train hard and train with enough volume and eat enough and like do what feels mostly right. And you're probably gonna be pretty good. But I, I do want to caveat that that like, yes, there are certain instances where like specifics are very important. Yeah. No, I think that um, especially with our content, 
the if if someone is familiar with our content and hears you say that, they're probably like, Alex super disagrees. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not so much that I super disagree. I think that um when it comes to training different divisions of any muscle group, yeah, I think that there's certainly value to them, or we wouldn't do all the education that we do, you know, around it. Um, but do I think that each person needs to have like if they're if we're splitting the chest into two or three divisions, do I think that they need to have an angle to how they're targeting their chest in three different ways in the same session. I don't think that that's necessary. And I think that the greater specificity becomes more important for the competitors who are trying to change a particular aspect of their body to show on stage. Yeah. Like they may have something, I think glutes is, is one of them where we can kind of play with things a little bit. Um, but even, even the chest to a, to a degree, when it comes to the upper chest, um, we're able to make some, uh, improvements in that arena, but also it gives clients an opportunity for variety to their program design, yeah. which I think that that allows for adherence to also be better long-term. Me understanding as the coach of these exercises are maybe having a greater bias towards a portion of the chest, but in all reality, the pec itself is contracting. That's the that At the end of the day, a majority of the pec is going to be contracting in some way or contributing to the function. I understand that, but also giving that variety and maybe a greater bias towards that particular area is going to be helpful long term. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. And I think my – so my question, what, what would you typically program for the divisions of the – of the packs, like, uh, just say like two exercises for each. So if I was to do like you have with everything that's attaching to the sternum, yeah. th- that's just going to be such a major bulk. So it's like, if we are wanting to grow the chest, all those sternal fibers are what I'm going to be hitting the absolute most. Right. So like your flat pressing, even to the like low incline press, I think is still going to be in that arena. One of the things that I find to be some of the most challenging are some of those lower fibers that um, I, we would consider costal is what we call them yeah. um, because of, of how individual sternum sit. Like mine dips down quite a bit. Like mine is not just like a straight line. So for me to really align with those, I've really got to like puff my chest yeah. and get aligned. And so body positioning being a, a big part of it, I think, but to come back to the question of how I would structure things maybe for like an upper chest and then for, let's say, we'll call it mid to lower chest is that I would just have like a, I really like the multi-grip bar for like a flat press. Yeah. And then for like upper chest is, is one where it, it like a 30 our 45 degree incline press would work there for me. Um, I also really like, and, I, and I'm sure that you've come, a, a, like you've seen this, but the the cable press arounds, have you, uh, yes, I have have you done those. some yeah. of those? Those have been good for me as of late. Programming them, tough. Yeah. Like teaching them online is not overly easy. And I, and this may be a, uh, a, misunderstanding of me or, or, um, how I go about it because teaching it online has been a hurdle. Yeah. It could be the movement. It could be how my understanding is, but I have enjoyed the, the cable press rounds to be more towards those clavicular fibers out of the upper chest. So yeah, that makes sense. And I think the way that I approach stuff is, is getting variety in mm-hmm. and training the pecs through different angles, through different positions through different rep ranges, through even, you know, different goals, right? So I, I don't think that progressive overload always has to be the goal for every single movement. Um, but even within that, even if I don't focus on dividing the pecs into divisions, I think that having more of a a comprehensive approach to it in general kind of necessitates that the entire for sure pec spectrum gets hit. Uh, my My concern has always been now, where is where is the line drawn between specificity and the ability to continue to overload and like generate enough stimulus to where it's actually useful or or worthwhile? Um, and and I will say that I, I I see a lot of movements that people do where they they set it up so intricately to where I'm like, there's no way that you can generate enough stimulus or intensity on this or or torque on this to where it's you know, more impactful than just doing a, a regular fucking movement with a lot of load, you know? Um, 
and there are certain movements where I've tried and I'm like, damn, like this, it feels good. feels comfortable, but like, I just can't use any load whatsoever on it. So that's always been my thing. I think Do you have any that come to mind. Um, dude, honestly, like a, a load of high cable fly. Okay. Yeah. Like I, I like the movement. It feels yeah. comfortable for me, but I always have felt very much like, like I, I just, I can't use enough load to where it makes too much of a difference where I would like really be able to make like tangible progress okay. using that for a while. And then yeah. that totally might just be me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think it, when we look at the, uh, the moment arm of that, yeah, especially if you're loading it in your hand, like the likelihood that you're going to be able, especially with your strength, yeah, to be able to get enough real tension to the pec with like, it's just, it's probably not the best movement for you specifically. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and there are definitely a lot of like specific ind- independent factors that, that have to go into every single movement that gets selected. And it's easy to overlook that whenever you're just broadly prescribing stuff or talking about an exercise without uh, an avatar in mind. Oh, of course. And and honestly, I, I think that that's where a lot of people can talk past one another whenever it comes to content creation is like, if you're just talking about an exercise without thinking about a specific person that it applies to, it it is totally fine. But then people will start coming out of the woodwork and being like, oh, well, like I tried this and it doesn't work for me or, oh, like this doesn't work for this type of person or have you thought about this? And it's like, bro, I was just thinking, talking about one movement. Yeah. Like I, I wasn't trying to actually like, you know, make it worthwhile or applicable to every single person in the world. Um, but yeah, just in general, it's like I, I like specificity, but I've always found that there needs to be like a certain cutoff with that. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's uh, also it, I gotta use the restroom. I got a piece of we'll, fucking bag. We'll call it here. Are you good, <laughs> yeah. dude? I was like, like for the past five minutes, I was like, oh fuck, man, I got a piece of fucking bag. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you leave a comment. Let us know what the favorite part of the episode was, and we'll see you in the next episode.